Today we're very pleased to have one of the most one of the most important voices in the wine industry today to talk about two themes. One in particular is that needs much more attention is wine fraud. The other will be about China's wine revolution. Counterfeit wine is a real concern in the industry. I'm sure many of you have heard alarming stories from friends in the industry locally or internationally, although nothing's dominated conversations more in recent years than the case of Indonesian fine wine dealer Rudy Kurniawan, who was arguably the biggest vino con artist of the 21st century. But locally too, I'm sure many of you, some of you sitting in this room, have probably tasted or encountered or accidentally bought fake wine. Jeannie Trolley will talk about how prevalent is this problem, how is this issue being handled, how China's entry to, entry to the industry um, as a major consumer and producer have encouraged a black market of faked wines. On the second theme of the talk, Jeannie will talk about wine trends, consumption trends as well, if aus especially the austerity measures in China and whether that's dampened the thirst for Bordeaux whether China's huge appetite for Bordeaux is now over, and also whether China will generate top quality wines. Our speaker is quite the high achiever. Uh, Jeannie acquired a master's degree at Harvard University, then eventually became the first Asian master of wine. She wears additional vino-related hats, including a professor of wine at Hong Kong Polyte Polytechnic University, a certified wine educator and author of pioneering wine books such as Asian Palette and also Mastering Wine for the Asian Palette, which are both available for sales right here. It's my pleasure to welcome Jeannie Cho Lee. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Nani. Um, and uh, thanks for all your attention. I know that you probably have a very busy schedule and I was told I only have 20 minutes to give uh, the presentation on such varied topics like wine fraud, as well as uh, China's wine revolution and its current status as, um, as, as really a leader in both consumer and in the production of wine. And I wanna finally uh, touch upon um, the issue of how Bordeaux is really on the decline in China. So the three questions I hope to answer by the end of this talk is, first, how prevalent is fake wine? What is China's impact as a player, both as consumer and producer uh, in the wine industry? And the third question is really, is it over for Bordeaux? Okay, um, to talk about fake wines, I think we really need to understand what extent and level of fake wines we're talking about. So this example here is of a very blatant knockoff. You can see that actually Penfolds, sorry, Penfolds, one of the most popular brands in China, has been written as Panfoids. But if you look, um, you don't need to look too closely to see that's, a, that's a, just a cheap imitation and knockoff. And of course, penfolds can often come with a little B that you can't see very well. Uh, but these are common and people um, who are making these sort of very easy to identify knockoffs are definitely getting arrested in China and they're doing a huge crackdown. One of the major um, fairs in China is the Chengdu Wine Fair, which is sponsored by the government. And, and in the last two years that I've been attending, uh, there's been a real cleanup, whereas about four or five years ago, if you went to these national Chinese wine fairs, you would see wines like this with Benfolds or Benfoids uh, being sold uh, by, by importers, and now all of that's been pretty much cleaned up. Now, then you get to a different kind of sophisticated fake where um, when you look at the label, it's not very clear whether it's real or not. And it takes a professional to look very closely to know that, for example, uh, this particular bottle of Domaine Ponceau 1929 Claude de la Roche was never produced in 1929. So these are kind of insider facts that you would have uh, if you were in the wine industry. But again, uh, these are the wines that you would often see. Now the ones that we're really worried about in the fine wine industry is actually the type of very sophisticated fake wines. 
And this is a problem that I'm sure all of you have come across living here in Hong Kong, which is that the um, empty bottles of your favorite uh, Cru Classe Bordeaux, it could be a Lynchbage, it could be a Latour Lafitte, they have a resale market value. Depending on the vintage, it could be anywhere in the tune of 500 Hong Kong dollars to up to 5,000 or 10,000 Hong Kong dollars because these bottles are refilled. And when the original bottle is refilled, even a professional looking at it will be very, very hard pressed to find exactly what's wrong. Now a real pro will then go on and look at the capsule. We know that if it's a lead capsule, then it had to have been made uh, 30, 40 years ago. In the last couple of decades, it's been tin aluminum cas capsules that have predominated the market. So when you look at the bottle itself, you know that um, certain bottle shapes and ways of ma bottle making and technology has progressed over the years. So has printing for uh, wine labels. So all of these are clues. Now, I, I want to iterate the fact that actually fake wines is actually not a Chinese and Hong Kong problem at all. It is for sure a global problem. And Nanhi just mentioned Rudy Kurniawan. Um, he was sentenced to 10 years in jail just last year. Um, he was asked to pay uh, 40 million US dollars plus uh, in fines and as well when the FBI discovered his, um, his, his whole uh, fake winemaking scheme at his home, they found, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of this, just you know, dozens of, of labels of different vintages of Petrus, as well as you know, corks and so forth. But this problem has also been going on even earlier than that. Um, Hardy Rodenstock is another name that has been circulating among um, the circuit for someone who sold fraudulent wines. And he's never been accused because of these legal um, issues that happened when he was being uh, sued in a New York court. But he had uh, uh, some sort of clemency being a German citizen. And um, although he was not arrested, we know that uh, a lot of the wines that he had put into the market were, were fake. Um, and so when you look at the court cases that have come up, really in the United States, and why in the US? Because since the 1980s, it's the United States that has been the biggest fine wine buyer. And it's only in the last 10 to 15 years that that, that, that shift has really you know, made it to Hong Kong and uh, more recently to China. But um, the, the case of Rudy Kurniawan uh, in the 2000s, especially from 2006 to 2008, for example, he was asking restaurants like Cru, uh, Veritas, and lots of others in New York City that had some of the best wine lists in the world to send him all the empty bottles. And they did this not knowingly for many years until finally um, someone said, hey, why, why is he so obsessed with getting all these empty bottles? So it is a global problem and we have to be vigilant about it because it is, it is shifting to Asia. And one only needs to look at the wine auction figures to see that um, the amount of wine, fine wine auction sales here in Hong Kong, although recently has been slightly dampened by the austerity measures, um, in 2010, for example, it was ahead of New York and London. Um, and it's far ahead of London. It's always been number one or two, and we continue to see Hong Kong as a wine auction hub for the next five to 10 years, minimum. I want to give you, share with you a few examples of uh, fake wine cases. Now, cases like this come up all over China, and for various reasons. Um, and you can see, you don't see this so much in the English press, uh, but it is uh, reported in the Chinese press. Um, what is interesting is that. The three examples that I'm going to show you are from the wine-making regions in China, the biggest ones. So one of them, Shandong province. Why Shandong? Because, of course, it's the largest uh, wine-making province in China. Uh, historically, that's where uh, Changyu is based. Some of the big, uh, big wine industry titans uh, of China are, are based there. And, 
anything around a million RMB seems to get picked up by the local press. And they are now more and more making uh, arrests, and you can see that a lot of these are because they're obvious fakes. It's not hard to, to, to find what is fraudulent about these wines. And recently in Shandong, again, this is a huge counterfeit ring two, involving 200 million RMB worth. Um, and when police uncovered this, they actually quickly made the arrest, made it very public, and shared the information to, to actually also convince uh, the industry that they are taking steps. But I assure you that for every one that is reported and caught, there's probably at least 10 or more others that are not. Media in China has actually also been taking a role in doing exposés. So this particular case uh, in Hebei, Hebei is, uh, as you know, north of China, and they also have a very strong wine production um, industry, and it's flourishing. And so here, it was CCTV1 that exposed uh, all these fake wines that are being produced uh, there. And the reason for for these criminals establishing themselves in these provinces is because you can imagine access to capsules, to labels, to wine bottles is much, much easier in the province because it's such a big wine producing um, community. So here you can see that um, the main uh, um, suspect, Chen, uh, Chen Ping Wen, Wang, he was sentenced to life. And this is, a, um, this is a, a serious punishment for something that didn't involve a a murder or um, a, a serious crime. Um, but of course, $200 million worth is, is quite a lot of money. So when we're looking for, um, for fake wines, what really should we be looking at? Well, we've heard from many wine industry resources that in fact, if they had to list the, the, the types of most commonly faked wines, it comes from older vintages and especially in large formats. So anytime you see wines from 50s, 60s, and even up to about 70s, um, you have to be highly suspicious of its provenance and history, where it was kept, who bought it. Do you have uh, traceability for who was in possession of it? Where did it move? All those things. And, and also, of course, buying from a reliable source. And auction houses do not always keep and ask for all of these records. So it is up to you, the buyer, uh, to, 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 to get um, all that information and to request it before you make a bid. So Burgundies from pre-1980s and Bordeaux from pre-1970s are two very, uh, very commonly faked and forged wines. And it's also a matter of lo you know, looking at the appropriateness of that decade, of that age, to what the bottle says it is. For me, one of the, uh, you know, recently, this was about a year ago in China, um, I was invited to a wine tasting in Beijing, and I was very impressed with the, with the you know, selection and, and the type of impressive wines that this collector uh, had amassed. And he opened up all these wonderful vintages. And there was one 1982 Lafitte that was kind of suspicious. And the bottle looked great, the capsule, everything was authentic. And finally, when I asked um, the sommelier to bring me the corks, uh, while the label said 1982, the corks said 1981. So it's very clear that that was a refilled bottle with a label that had either been completely redone or um, the number had been very... Uh, very cleverly changed, just to change one number to another. So one can easily become four or seven or you know two. So depending on the vintage, um, the prices can be more than double uh, an inferior vintage. So, and also look out for specific brands uh, that are most counterfeited. And you know, Petrus, Mouton, Lafitte, Margot. Uh, now there seems to be more and more suspicion about Domaine de la Romane Conti or DRC. Uh, so these are the wine names to look out for. But it doesn't mean that the um, the the kind of obvious fakes are not a problem. It just means that 
It depends on the market and the type of distribution you're looking at. So if you're in Hong Kong and you're looking at auctions and you're looking specifically at fine wines, these are definitely uh, the list that you should have on, on, on the types of wines you should be suspicious about. But on the other hand, if you're in mainland China, they have, um, they've had fake wines of Mouton Cadet. So it doesn't necessarily mean that it's only at the fine wine segment that uh, you have this problem. It's really at all uh, levels. Just to give you a quick update about the, the Hong Kong and China position about fake wines, it's um, very difficult. Uh, first, uh, because as you can imagine, it's, you know, it's one thing to have the packaging material be an obvious fake, but it's another if everything looks genuine, and the only t way you can tell the difference is because you're an experienced taster, and you've had a 1961 Petrus numerous times, and you can tell that this particular bottle is not what it purports to be. So on a very small percentage of cases, you do need a professional who can actually give you an opinion based on their experience, tasting and knowing uh, what to look for. But for for legal purposes, um, really it's, it's about um, protecting your intellectual property, and that means having wineries who've actually trademarked their names, their logos, um, and then going through the legal process. And I have spoken actually with both customs in China and in Hong Kong, and while they're um, very supportive of being able to help and do something, the ability to prosecute is very, very small because they need proof. And oftentimes, um, unless you have that packaging proof by taste alone, it's really difficult um, to, to, um, to prove. So in China and Hong Kong, you have these numbers that you can call, so there is a recourse. But when I, when I asked Hong Kong Customs how many people have actually reported and used this to report fake wines, they said, well, last year, none. So let me touch upon in the next um, about five to six minutes about China's impact and um, you know what impact it's made. I mean, you can see from these numbers that actually the impact is tremendous. It is really shifting the world of wine from Europe and North America to Asia. And this is done both on the production side, and I know Nanhe mentioned that I might be talking about China as a wine producer, but I feel like that would be the subject for a second talk, a follow-up talk, because there is so much to talk about in terms of how China is growing as a wine producer. But not yet as, um, as a fine wine producer that can compete with the very best from, of wines from around the world. I think that may happen uh, in my lifetime, um, uh, but not something that I foresee in the next five to seven years. So you can see from these numbers that China's really impressive. Um, and what is on a lot of people's minds these days, because really, uh, our interest for Bordeaux is really declining. If you look at any numbers, you can see that, um, for example, in China and, and in Hong Kong, um, about 50% of uh, the kind of, of the countries that export to, to, to Hong Kong and China have been dominated by France. And what that means that um, in that category of French wines, the majority is Bordeaux. So when we talk about a fourth year decline in Bordeaux, we're actually talking about the entire wine category as well, especially for French wines. And there's no doubt that people are just fed up for a lot of reasons. Prices have been too high. So now you can see that uh, people are owning up to the fact that when you buy wines, especially as futures, which is the most common way that the top 700 or so chateaus uh, in Bordeaux sell their wines. So before they're bottled, two years before they're bottled, they sell them as futures. And uh, the idea behind this distribution network is to say that when you have an allocation of this futures, then the price that you paid at such an early stage should be a lot cheaper than when they're actually in bottle. But that has not been the case for 2009 and 2010. So people are feeling a little burnt. Um, so, so imports are down. 
so futures, there seems to be no interest in both the industry um, as well as uh, you know, among, uh, among traders and consumers alike. And even just just as interesting um, is that you know, very every month or so, I'm up in Shanghai and I host a group of wine industry uh, people as well as uh, opinion leaders in in the field. And when I ask them to to bring your own wine and we have a casual meal, for the last six months, nobody in a group of about 20 has brought a bottle of Bordeaux. That tells you quite a lot about the general sentiment of people within the industry and the key opinion leaders about how much they feel burnt um, about Bordeaux. So these are just some figures, and I'm going to kind of go through this quickly so you have an idea. Um, you can see that French wine takes up quite a huge percentage, uh, up to about half. Um, and if you look at uh, the total, you're looking at about 37.5 million imported wines into Hong Kong and China. Um, by value, you can see that even though the number here, if you look at um, the small, I'm sorry, I th think there should have been a clarification. So the small lighter red on top is that portion that belongs to, um, that belongs to Hong Kong. And the darker red is the portion that belongs to China. So by volume, uh, Chinese, the Chinese import market is about five times the size, and yet by value you can see they're kind of on parity. So we are, for Hong Kong, a real fine wine drinking city. Um, and you can see the average prices of, of wines, these are in US dollars. Uh, these are per bottle prices, is among the highest in the entire world. China is at about five US dollars, but Hong Kong is at 42 dollars per bottle. That's average US dollars. The trend is definitely up. And if you compare it to the rest of the world where uh, North America, they expect wine industry to grow by about 9% um, uh, per year. In Asia, it's still in the double digits over the next three to five years. And still, if you look at the top 10 destination for Bordeaux, really, um, China is number one. By value, it's Hong Kong and China, but in the last couple of years, the UK has overtaken. So the question remains, is it over for Bordeaux? And I argue, no, it's not. Bordeaux still accounts for about a third of wines imported to China, about half of all wines imported into Hong Kong. And if you look at the Chinese consumption, it's really growing at a steady rate. These are real wine consumers, not the ones that we're buying for gift giving or for corporate entertainment, but true wine consumers. Um, and the CEO of ASC, John Watkins, for example, estimates that re there are about 40 million real wine drinkers in mainland China. And that's still a big and growing number. And it is the largest fine wine region of the world and on average, if you look at a, a Bordeaux Chateau like Lafitte, uh, Mouton, uh, or even Lynchbage, you're talking about 200 to 300,000 bottles produced annually. Very few regions can produce that quantity and quality. So Bordeaux is here to stay, but I think the next couple of years will really, uh, they'll, they'll have to struggle and win back uh, the, the respect and, and the heart of a lot of consumers. Now, I know I didn't really touch upon China's um, growth. Suffice it to say that um, I have been to most of the major wine regions, uh, especially the, the big, big region that everyone talks about right now is Ningxia. And they're doing, the province is doing a lot uh, to promote investment into the wine region, as well as giving out free land for wine producers who qualify. Uh, on 50-year leases. So there's a huge incentive and a huge push, but this is also, they're jockeying for position against Shandong uh, right now that has traditionally been the heart of uh, wine production in China. And um, 
I think that that in itself is such a vast topic. I just want to touch upon it and say that uh, the quality is improving year on year. I do see a lot of potential, but um, at the moment, as I said earlier, I don't see in the next five to seven years a fine wine uh, coming out of, out of China that competes with the very, very best in the world. So I have 20 minutes left for Q&A. Um, Nani, I'm on time, right? Thank you so much, Jeannie. Okay, uh, time for Q&As. If anyone has questions, please identify, put your hands up and identify yourself and the publication if you are with one, if you're working for one. Any questions? Oh, Tara. Tara. I can start. Um, mm -hmm. Jeannie, thanks so much. I'm Tara Joseph with Reuters. First of all, was the wine okay at lunch today? <laughs> Just want to check. <laughs> <laughs> That's for another class. The, okay. the Sauvignon Blanc I had from Chile was pretty good. In fact, uh, it's one of the regions where I think you're going to find a lot of well, value for money and, and good wines from cool regions. Yeah. That, that leads to my next question. Um, you mentioned how Bordeaux consumption has not been as high in China. So at that Shanghai gathering that you were mentioning and other things that you're seeing in China, what are the in wines? What are people looking for, both in terms of taste and in terms of labels? Yeah, Spain and Chile is really hot right now. Uh, Italian wines have continued to grow, but it's very interesting because I always expected Italian wines to do better than they have. I mean, in, in the United States, they're hugely successful. Uh, but in Asia, um, it, it seems to be kind of grouped toward the high end, the Super Tuscan, the Sasakaya, the Ornolayas, the Massettos. Um, at, at the very low end, they're popular because they go into Italian restaurants, your Chianti, uh, your Pinot Grigio. Uh, but in that middle sector where you have real consumers that drink wine on a regular basis, they seem not to be buying it in supermarkets or wine shops and taking it home. So the, the real interesting phenomena right now is uh, Spanish wines and the growth that, that Spanish wines have, have, um, have had and the success they've had. Um, in fact, you know, uh, uh, France is by far the, the leader and just beneath them is Italy, Australia, Spain, Chile, and um, you know, growing faster is the United States. And Spanish wines, because they're also fairly accessible, and the style is a, a little bit sweeter, um, and an obvious oak flavors, all of that seems to appeal very much to the Chinese right now. And oh, the other regions within France that are actually quite popular is, um, is Burgundy and Rhone. Burgundy especially, at the very high end. DRC is the new Lafitte right now. So I guess the question with, with that as well, if I, if I can just follow up, is it uh, a case of people wanting to expand their palate in China, um, or is it a changing taste uh, in you terms of matching with foods and what people are eating, et cetera? I like to believe it's a uh, changing of taste, but I fear that is not the truth. Having lived in Hong Kong for 21 years and traveled to China often, as you know, a lot of fashion trends and influences, uh, especially in China, happen from the top down. And the message from the top down right now is that don't drink expensive wine. Don't drink Bordeaux. They've gouged us. Uh, so when the top management, whether it's within a private company or in government, is sending that message, it trickles down very quickly to, to everyone else down the road. And it seems to be so untrendy to have Bordeaux that even in a private gathering, people are not bringing it. Any more questions? Oh, we've got quite a few. The gentleman over there. Uh, oh, please wait for the mic. Sorry. Uh, Alec Tracy, not with any publication. Um, if You've talked a lot about the wines in China. It seems like the discussion is mostly revolved around reds. Could you talk maybe a little bit about tastes in white wine and champagne and, and whether you see that evolving and how you see it developing? Yes, I was talking mostly about red because uh, consumption is 90% red. And it doesn't look like that's going to move at all. In fact, it's the same in Hong Kong and China right now. Um, and. It is growing, but the growth of white wine is happening in the more urbane, more um, westernized cities like Shanghai and uh, Guangzhou. It's less so in Beijing, or um, especially in the second tier. Second tiers is almost 99% red. Uh, so 
it is growing, but at, at a much slower rate than reds. And sparkling wine has done well, but mostly in the inexpensive category, so Italian Prosecco, uh, Spanish Cava. But again, that percentage of the market is so minute in the single percentages that um, people really don't talk about it because it's, it hasn't really made an impact on overall wine sales uh, as well as in volume. Okay, we've got a gentleman at the back there. Hello, I'm Ruben uh, Sommelier at large. <laughs> I heard you mention uh, a sort of hierarchy of Italy, Spain, Chile, etc. Where would you put Portugal and Portuguese wines on that list, and what do you see as the future for Portugal wine? It depends on whether you're Portuguese or not, first of all, I think, because then I think your hierarchy would be very different. Uh, but I think uh, Portuguese reds are really up and coming. Uh, and in terms of value, they're amazing. But how many people would recognize Toriga Nacional, Tinta Franca, <laughs> Pedro Jimenez. I mean, these are all uh, great varieties that people are not familiar with. And that's one of the marketing problems with, um, you know, with, uh, with, with the new dry red region. Because, you know, Portugal has been, has been the source for fortified wines, mostly, and run by the British merchant houses. And it, they're slowly trying to change that image. And I think it's definitely up and coming. But in in hierarchy, in terms of potential, I'd put it pretty high. But I would say in terms of recognition and potential for growth in mainland China, I would put it pretty low. Further questions? Uh, gentleman over there. Uh, thank you. No connection with the wine industry. Um, there's been a big increase in the number of chateaux bought by mainland Chinese buyers. Yes, um, there is you, over 60 could, right now. Could you care to comment on how that is going to affect the faking of the wine industry? And the second question is that mm -hmm. Bordeaux, sorry, Burgundy is much more, um, there, are, there are far many, far more variations of labels, and particularly in old Burgundy, uh, and there's been a lot of allegations about faking, but you go to Romani Conti or Ponceau and you'll find 10 different variations from a particular vintage. Um, so how accurate are these allegations that a lot of this has been faked? There have been all sorts of allegations by Dawn Cornwall and others. Yes, uh, exactly. And others would disagree. Mm. Well, I think the ones that have actually... Um made it through the legal process and, and have come through the court are ones that you could prove, where Aubert de Villan from DRC would say that looking at um, the packaging and even the, the, the whole label, this is not from our domain. You know, and it's the same with Ponceau. In fact, uh, the photo I showed you of uh, the Clos de la Roche 29 was the famous Acker auction where this wine was pulled in New York City because Laurent Ponceau, having been alerted that this wine was going up for auction, flew into New York and said, are you really going to auction these off? We never made these. And so even though he called John Capon and told him to take it off, uh, they were still going to go ahead with it. And then he showed up, so they pulled it out. But again, um, as many, as I said, that, that can be proved, there's probably you know, multiple times more that cannot be proved. So I think that is a serious issue. Um, to come back to your first question about all the Chinese buyers, there are now over 60 uh, Chinese chateau owners in Bordeaux. Burgundy seems to be less popular. The, the one that has been purchased by a, um, a a, a Macanese uh, is Louis Ang when he purchased Chateau Jeffrey Chambatin uh, to, 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 to actually, um, to, to a lot of very, very unhappy French people. It made, made the news for, for quite a number of weeks because the French said, how could you sell such a historical property to a foreigner? But anyway, um, going back to your question about uh, the impact, I, I think actually it's a very positive thing because it means that the Chinese have more to protect. Um, a lot of these properties are not your top end cru classe, they're your cru bourgeois. A lot have been purchased on the right bank in Saint Emilion and, and the Cote region. Uh, and they have more at stake in protecting Bordeaux and protecting 
um, fake wines. So I think it would have a positive impact. And on the other hand, you know, we don't get to see these wines because they have such a ready market amongst their own contacts in China that in fact the distribution no longer is global, but becomes almost um, you know, very, very narrowly channeled to the chateau owners 10 closest business associates and friends. So um, in that sense, I think uh, they're going out of the Bordeaux um, system. But the long-term effect is that the more Chinese people have a stake in Bordeaux and other wine regions in France, the more they will uh, have an interest in protecting the authenticity of wines from that region. So positive. Any more questions? Yes, gentlemen over there. Uh, I'm not a journalist. There is a new trend in China to manufacture wines using imported grape juice. So if this Did you say that was new? That's very old. Well, okay. Oh, oh right. <laughs> Forgive me. So this appears to be distorting the classifications of wines. So if you had uh, Spanish grape juice imported into China and fermented in China, is it a Spanish wine or is it a Chinese wine? Mm -hmm. How would you classify that? Where is it? Uh, what would you expect to appear on the label? Well, it should say bottled in China. And then somewhere on the back label, it should clarify where the grapes were from. Legally, that's, that's what you need to do. So it's bottled, bottled in China. Bottled and made in China, but the original source of the grapes. Uh, I think you've, you've seen a few wines out of Hong Kong. Eighth Estate, for example. Um, and you know, you, I think if you look at the back label, they will actually tell you where the grapes are from. But they do have a made in Hong Kong label, which says it was produced and crafted um, you know, here, but uh, actually the grapes were frozen and brought over for the juice. But your question is, how clear is this in China right now? Uh, we know that for many, many years, the large companies like Zhang Yu, Kafka, Dynasty, they didn't have enough quality grapes, so they brought in bulk wine in 20,000 liter containers and blended it with own local, you know, local juice. Now, whether it was only 10% or 90%, nobody knows. And if it's a, if it's a very small percentage, you know, you could legally say that you can, so by, by, by brand, you know, every country has different laws in terms of what you state, but in general, about 85% has to come from that variety or that region. And if you take that as kind of an average, then if they put in 5% or 10% of something else, it could be considered legal. So what that means is, um, you know, if they've been doing this for such a long time, um, how much now has the, the, the Chinese government cracked down on preventing this from happening? We, we do feel that because production in China, especially since it's moved from the East Coast, which is, as you can imagine, you know, terrible grape con growing conditions during the summer season, typhoon, uh, rain, 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 um, through the whole growing months of June to September. Now that it's moving west to Xinjiang, Gansu, Ningxia, where there's no rain, it's like a desert condition, grape quality has increased. And that means they're relying less on these bulk wine imports to blend with their own. Um, so it is changing, but um, no one really knows to what extent. Any more questions? Yes, we got it. And then... Hi, uh, Rodney Lord, I'm just a wine consumer, but uh, I'd just like to get your view about uh, wine auctions, especially online wine auctions. Uh, there's a lot of established auction houses that have a wine uh, online only auction segment, and uh, as well as specialist online auction houses like Wine Bid mm -hmm. or other houses like you know, KL, KL Wines in the US have an auction, uh, online only auction. Can they be trusted from a wine, a wine fraud perspective, do you think? Yeah, I think it really depends on how much information they're sharing with you. So if they can give you some sort of traceability about where the wine, uh, who the previous owners of these wines were, and how they kept them, and if they have, 
For example, if it was stored at Octavian in London, um, since it was brought into London, let's say, uh, for 20 years, and you were the first or second buyer of it, and it's never moved, and they can prove that, then it has what I would call, consider excellent provenance. And those can be trusted. But there are a lot of auction houses that just put the names of the wine, the vintage, and a price on it. And with that, I would say it's really uh, buyer beware. Because if you don't ask for proof of where these wines were, it's, it, they assume you're going to do their homework. And so I would be very wary. Um, and if you're buying anything above, let's say, uh, 10,000 Hong Kong dollars a bottle on auction uh, through, through online, I would always, always ask for photos. So you can see the fill levels, how, 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 where the wine lies in the bottle. Um, I would l l ask for high resolution um, photos of the packaging. If it was in an original wooden case, where was it stored? How is the condition? Close-ups of the label, the capsule. And if possible, now a lot of the wine auction houses are carefully even removing the foil so you can see from the cork whether it has the vintage on it or not. So they'll do that for you. So I think it, it is really up to you to do your homework. We have another gentleman here. Uh, Jeff Chen, wine consumer in Hong Kong. What's your, do you, what's your practical advice for the average wine drinker in Hong Kong when he goes to a restaurant in terms of selection? I'll tell you what mine is, and if you can improve on that. Okay. okay. Mine that is, good. I pick the cheapest wine on the menu. Uh-huh. 85% of the time. It's not bad. <laughs> right? I feel like you get okay value. You must be going to some good restaurants. <laughs> then, then you go, you go to you know, anything that's more expensive, anything over 1000 maybe 2000 85% of the time, big disappointment. Oh, right. Right? Okay. So that's my advice. I get to myself. And if, mm. if you can improve, you know, like, you know <laughs> on what, what, I mean, unless you know the wine. There's yes. wines I know. Yes. But they're most of the wines I don't know. Okay. Whenever I give wine advice about selection, I always say, listen, we have to do a very brief kind of wine therapy session. It takes no more than five or ten minutes. But it's about, for, it's about you finding out what it is you like. So the best way for you to give me, think of me as a doctor analyzing your condition, okay? Um, I would ask you questions like, what kind of wine style do you like? And the more specific examples you can give me, which is vintages, producer, and region, the more I can help you in diagnosing the right cure. Uh, <laughs> and actually, that's, that's how you start, by, by asking someone, what is it that you like? Think of all the wines that you really enjoy, and let's put it in a bucket and try to figure out what's your palate, what's your palate preference, and depending on what you like, then I can lead you to styles that are um, perhaps slightly um, challenging but related to your, the style that you like, uh, others that are really in your safety zone that you might enjoy, but also at different price brackets because it depends on how much you're willing to spend. And I think the world of wine is so big that in fact, um, I can't imagine anyone not finding a wine that they don't really enjoy. But it's a matter of really um, understanding. And, and I tell everyone the same thing. Um, if you have trouble remembering uh, which wine you liked and you know all the wine labels and names seem the same to you. Next time you have the wine, one wine that has really just, you know, made you open your eyes and say, wow, this is something, this is great, then please, please remember the name of the producer, the name of that grape, the origin, where it's from, and the vintage. And with that information, a very good sommelier or a very good wine consultant can lead you to the direction that they would like to take you because they know what you like. But to start out with just price is kind of throwing a dart you know, in, in, a, in a black hole because you don't know what you're aiming for. I'm not trying to evade your question, but I think, okay. We've got a question right at the back. I think that'll be our last question. Hi, thank you very much. <clears throat> my name is Po Chi Wu, and my interest actually is in the innovation side. And I wanted to ask uh, whether some of the, what are some of the premium labels doing 
to protect their new vintages. Obviously, old things, you know, it's a different problem. Yes. But in terms of new wines they're producing, let's say, in the last couple of years and looking forward, mm -hmm. what are they doing to protect their labels in terms of authenticity and so on? Oh, a lot of things, actually. Um, so I can rattle them off to you. Some are um, having each of their labels uh, and, and each bottle actually numbered. They've always had a bottling lot number in the back of the bottle, but in addition to that, they're actually numbering each bottle so they know where it's distributed, where it's gone. So as soon as they look at the bottle label number, they know who they've sold it to and they have traceability that way. They're also doing, um, there's a lot of technology now that has to do with protecting the capsule, because once you remove the capsule, there's foolproof tags, there's um, all kinds now. There's at least five or six different kinds of technologies that, that you can find. And a lot of it surrounds how and when you remove the capsule, because that's when you can tamper with the product, right? you know, the inside of the bottle. So the outside packaging is one part, but the capsule um, is another. And whenever I talk to... Uh, chateaus and, and top domains in Burgundy. How are you protecting yourself? They said, you know, if we told you, then the forgers out there would be doing exactly uh, what we don't want them to do and understanding our technology so, they so they'll be able to get around it. So um, I think from about, I would say, 2005 vintage onwards, uh, most of the top properties in, in Bordeaux are pretty well protected and I would say, um, more and more, more recently in the Burgundian domains, they're, they're taking the same, same action. So there is a, there is a way now of, of ensuring that your wine bottle has not been tampered with. Okay, I'm sorry we're kind of over time. And thank you very much, Jimmy Cholli, everyone. Thanks for coming.